We can go ahead and uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, get things started this evening. I'd like to welcome everyone this evening to the first ever Ratio Christi debate featuring Dr. Michael Tooley and Dr. William Lane Craig. My name is Brendan Helms and I'm the co-director of Ratio Christi. The purpose of Ratio Christi is to create intellectual discussion on various issues related to Christianity on college campuses. We have weekly meetings in which we discuss and learn about these critical issues. Here at UNC Charlotte, our group meets on Thursday evenings at 7 o'clock in Fretwell 124. For anyone that is interested in joining us for these meetings, please see the back of your program for contact information. On top of these weekly meetings, we also host major events such as this debate. Events like this debate involve a tremendous amount of work and financial help. Ratio Christie would like to thank the following donors, without whom this debate would not have been possible. Mrs. Charlotte Helms, Northside Baptist Church, Mr. and Mrs. Keith Helms, Mrs. Velma Everett, Mr. and Mrs. Tim Gardner, and Catawba Heights Baptist Church. We would also like to thank the following individuals who have put a, a tremendous amount of time and effort into making this debate possible. The UNCC Ratio Christi students, Mrs. Sherry Bruce, and Mr. Vidal Dickerson. We would also like to thank the following institutions of higher education who have put forth a tremendous effort in making this debate possible. The University of North Carolina in Char at Charlotte and Southern Evangelical Seminary. If it is the desire of Ratio Christi to make these type of events open to anyone. Therefore, we do not charge to attend the debate. However, there are costs associated with these events. And if you're interested in donating for this event and similar future events, please put a donation in the response box along with your response card as you leave this evening. Before turning things over to our moderator for the evening, let me introduce him. Richard G. Howe is a professor of philosophy and apologetics at Southern Evangelical Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina, and is the director of the Ph.D. program there. He has a B.A. in Bible from Mississippi College, an M.A. in philosophy from the University of Mississippi, and a Ph.D. in philosophy from the University of Arkansas. Both his master's thesis and doctoral dissertation focused on the issue of the existence of God. He is a contributor to several books, including the popular Encyclopedia of Apologetics, Reasons for Faith, To Everyone an Answer, and is a contributing writer for the Christian Research Journal. He has spoken in the United States and Canada, as well as Europe and Africa, on issues relating to the defense of the Christian faith. In their free time, Richard and his wife, Rebecca, enjoy international travel. Please join me in welcoming our moderator for the evening, Dr. Richard Howe. Thank you. Well, let me add my welcome to what Brendan has said, and I trust that you are not unwell tonight as you come out for this uh, debate. I deem it a special honor to moderate a debate between two formidable philosophers. As a student of philosophy who focused on the issues of God's existence, both in my master's thesis and my doctoral dissertation, I find this topic of extreme interest. And as a Christian, indeed, as a human being, I find the topic profoundly significant. Now, it's not uncommon on such occasions for the moderator to say something relevant if not clever and interesting, to help set the tone of the evening and frame the importance of the topic. But in the interest of both time and aesthetics, I will forego such an endeavor. <laughs> Our esteemed debaters will no doubt be able to set the tone for themselves, and your presence here tonight already indicates that you're keenly aware of its significance. I should like instead to give a brief bio of each participant explain the format of their engagement, and explain how you can be involved tonight through the question and answer period. By way of commercial, be aware that each of our debaters has books for sale in the back, and a DVD of the debate will be available in the near future for purchase. William Lane Craig is a research professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology in La Mirada, California. He earned a doctorate in philosophy at the University of Birmingham, England, before taking a doctorate in theology from the Ludwig Maximilians Universität München, Germany, where he was for two years a fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung. Prior to his appointment at Talbot, he spent seven years at the Higher Institute of Philosophy at the Catholic University Leuven, Belgium. Dr. Craig has authored or edited over 30 books, including The Kalam Cosmological Argument, Divine Foreknowledge and Human Freedom, Theism, Atheism, and Big Bang Cosmology, God, Time, and Eternity, and On Guard, as well as over a hundred articles in professional journals of philosophy and theology. 
including the Journal of Philosophy, American Philosophical Quarterly, Philosophical Studies, Philosophy, and the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science. Michael Tooley is a graduate of the University of Toronto with a BA and Princeton University with a PhD. Formerly Professor of Philosophy at the University of Western Australia and Senior Research Fellow at the Australian National University. Dr. Tooley is currently a distinguished college professor in the philosophy department at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Dr. Tooley's books include Causation, A Realist Approach, Time, Tense, and Caus Causation, Knowledge of God, co-authored with Alvin Plantica as part of the Blackwell's Great Debates in Philosophy series. Dr. Tooley is a fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities, a former president of the Australasian Society of Philosophy, and currently vice president, and thus president-elect, of the Pacific Division of the American Philosophical Association. The format of tonight's debate is as follows. There will be a 20-minute opening by each debater, followed by 12-minute rebuttals, followed by 8-minute rebuttals, ending with 5-minute closings. After the debate proper, we will have a question and answer session. There will be two microphones set up. If you have a question for Dr. Craig, you will need to line up behind the microphone in his side of the auditorium. If you have a question for Dr. Tooley, you will have to line up with, a, uh, line up with the microphone on his side of the auditorium. We will alternate questions between debaters. Each will be given two minutes to respond to the question, and the other will, be, will have one minute to counter-respond. Now, while we understand that some questions might require a setup or a context, we ask you to please make your question as concise and to the point as possible and avoid trying to enter into the debate yourself. <laughs> we also ask that you respect the opportunity of others to ask questions and avoid the temptation to try to ask a follow-up question. Any egregious offense in this regard may result in the judgment and wrath of God <laughs> if Dr. Craig wins the debate. Or you may end up overwrought with wrong-making properties and succumb to gratuitous evil and suffering if Dr. Tooley wins the debate. <laughs> we also ask that you will hold your applause except for the moderator. <laughs> if you would hold your applause until the debate proper is completely done, that is, you can applaud for both debaters, perhaps maybe at the very beginning here in a moment, but then after the second rebuttal is done, before we start the question and answer to show your appreciation one more time. And one last thing, if you would make sure that you set your ringtone to the wackiest ringtone you have and turn it up as loud as possible so the DVD will be able to pick it up. No, that's not true. I just made that part up. <laughs> Seriously, if you would be so kind as to put your phone either on vibrate or turn it off altogether for the sake of the recording. So let us begin then with the first opening by Dr. William Lane Craig. Thank you very much. Good evening. I want to begin by thanking Rafael Christie for inviting me to participate in tonight's debate. Uh, Michael Keaton and I have actually participated before, so I think that I can confidently say that we're in for a uh, challenging and enlightening discussion this evening. Now, let me just pause and ask, is my microphone on? It doesn't sound like it. Okay. Oh, it's in my pocket. Is the shot collar on, too? Yes, now, now it should. <laughs> Is it on now? It's on now? All right. Well, for the sake of the recording, <laughs> I will begin again uh, and say good evening and uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank Razio Christie for inviting me to participate in tonight's debate. Uh, Michael Tooley and I have debated previously on this topic, and so I know that we're going to be in for a, a challenging and enlightening discussion this evening. Now, in tonight's debate, uh, I'm going to defend one basic contention, namely that the arguments for theism are better than the arguments for atheism. And this will involve two subpoints. First, that there are good reasons to think that theism is true. And secondly, that there are not comparably good reasons to think that atheism is true. Now, I'll leave it up to Dr. Tooley to present his arguments for atheism before I respond to them. 
In this opening speech, I want to sketch briefly five lines of evidence that weigh in favor of God's existence. As a professional philosopher, I think that God makes sense of a wide range of the data of human experience, including philosophical, scientific, moral, historical, and existential considerations. Number one, then, God is the best explanation of the origin of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Why anything at all exists rather than just nothing? Typically, atheists have said that the universe is just eternal and uncaused. But there are good reasons, both philosophically and scientifically, to doubt that this is the case. Philosophically, the idea of an infinite past seems absurd. Just think about it. If the universe never began to exist, then that means that the number of events in the past history of the universe is infinite. But mathematicians recognize that the existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to self-contradictions. For example, what is infinity minus infinity? Well, mathematically, you get self-contradictory answers. This shows that infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. David Hilbert, who was perhaps the greatest mathematician of the 20th century, wrote, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a rational basis for thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. But that fails that since past events are not just ideas in your mind but are real, the number of past events must be finite. And therefore, the theories of past events can't just go back and back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. This conclusion has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. We now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning about 14 billion years ago in a cataclysmic event known as the Big Bang. What makes the Big Bang so startling is that it represents the origin of the universe from literally nothing. For all matter and energy, even physical space and time themselves, came into being at the moment of the Big Bang. Now, of course, alternative theories have been crafted over the years to try to avoid the absolute beginning predicted by the standard model. But none of these theories has commended itself to the scientific community as more plausible than the Big Bang theory. Physicist PCW Davies concludes, the coming into being of the universe, as discussed in modern science, is not just a matter of imposing some sort of organization upon a previous incoherent state, but literally the coming into being of all physical things from nothing. But then the inevitable question arises, why? Why did the universe come into being 14 billion years ago? Anthony Kenny of Oxford University a proponent of the Big Bang Theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But surely that doesn't make sense. Out of nothing, nothing comes. This is a fundamental principle in the philosophy of science. What philosopher of science Bernard Kahnitschreiter calls the most successful philosophical principle in the history of science. So why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? Where did it come from? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. We can summarize our argument thus far as follows. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe begins to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, as the cause of space and time, this cause must be an uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial being of unfathomable power. Moreover, 
it must be personal as well. Why? Because this cause must be beyond space and time. Therefore, it cannot be physical or material. Now, there are only two kinds of things that fit that description. Either abstract objects, like a number or else an unembodied mind or consciousness. But abstract objects can't cause anything. The number seven, for example, has no effect upon anything. So the cause of the universe can't be an abstract object. It therefore follows that the cause of the universe is a transcendent, personal, unembodied mind. Number two, God is the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. In recent decades, scientists have been stunned by the discovery that the initial conditions of the Big Bang were fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life with a precision and delicacy that literally defy human comprehension. This fine-tuning is of two sorts. First, when the laws of nature are expressed as mathematical equations, you find appearing in certain constants, like the gravitational constant. These constants are not determined by the laws of nature. Second, in addition to these constants, there are certain arbitrarily quantities, which are just put in as initial conditions on which the laws of nature operate. For example, the amount of entropy or the balance between matter and antimatter in the universe. Now, all of these constants and quantities fall into an extraordinarily narrow range of life-permitting values. Were these constants or quantities to be altered by less than a hair's breadth, the balance would be destroyed and life could not exist. For example, if atomic weak force were altered by as little as one part out of 10 to the 100th power, the universe would not have been life permitting. The probability that all of the constants and quantities would fall by chance alone into the life permitting range is vanishingly small. We now know that life prohibiting universes are incomprehensible in probability than any life permitting universe. Now, there are only three possible explanations of this extraordinary fine tuning. Physical necessity, chance, or design. Now, it can't be due to physical necessity because, as we've seen, the constants and quantities are independent of the laws of nature. In fact, string theory allows for around 10 to the 500th power different possible universes compatible with nature's laws. So, maybe the fine-tuning of the universe is due to chance. After all, highly improbable events happen every day. But what serves to distinguish purely chance events from design is not simply enormously high improbability, but also the presence of an independently given pattern to which the event conforms. The fine tuning of the universe for intelligent life exhibits just that combination of incomprehensible improbability and an independently given pattern that are the earmarks of design. Hence, we have good reason to think that, two, it is not due to physical necessity or chance, from which we may conclude, three, therefore, it is due to design. Thus, the fine-tuning universe implies the existence of a designer of the cosmos. Number three, God is the best explanation of objective moral values and duties in the world. If God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. By objective moral values, I mean values which are valid and binding whether anyone believes in them or not. And many theists and atheists alike agree that if God does not exist, then moral values and duties are not objective in this sense. For example, Michael Roos, an agnostic philosopher of science, explains, the position of the modern evolutionist is that morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, 
Ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. On a naturalistic view, moral values are just the byproduct of biological evolution and social conditioning. Just as a troop of baboons will exhibit uh, cooperative and even self-sacrificial behavior, because natural selection has determined it to be advantageous in the struggle for survival. So their primate cousins, Homo sapiens, has developed similar behavior for the same reason. As a result of socio-biological pressures, there has emerged among Homo sapiens a sort of herd morality, which is effective in the per uh, perpetuation of our species. But on the atheistic view, there doesn't seem to be anything about Homo sapiens that makes this morality objectively true. On this view, certain actions like rape or incest are not biologically and socially advantageous, and so in the course of human development have become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to show that rape and incest are morally wrong. Such behavior goes on all the time in the animal kingdom. The rapist who goes against the herd morality is doing nothing more serious than acting unfashionably, uh, the behavioral equivalent of Lady Gaga. <laughs> on a naturalistic view, it's hard to see any reason to think that anything is objectively wrong or right. But the problem is, two objective values and duties do exist. In moral experience, we apprehend a realm of objective values and duties that impose themselves upon us. There's no more reason to deny the existence of objective moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. Actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. Michael Roos himself admits, and I quote, the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Some things, at least, are really wrong. There is real evil in the world. But then it follows logically and inescapably, therefore, God exists. Some people think that the evil in the world disproves God. I think the exact opposite is true. Real evil in the world actually proves the existence of God. Since without God, the ground objective moral values, good and evil do not as such exist. Number four, the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus imply God's existence. The the historical person Jesus of Nazareth was a remarkable individual. Historians have reached something of a consensus that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come. As visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracles and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands, and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, most people would probably think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just accept by faith or not. But there are actually three established facts recognized by the majority of historians today which I believe are better explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, on the Sunday after his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Fact number two, on separate occasions, Joel and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent New Testament critic, 
Gallus Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies. Fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead despite every predisposition to the contrary. You see, Jews had no belief in a defeated and dying Messiah. And Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. N.T. Wright, uh, an eminent New Testament scholar, concludes, that is why, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, like the disciples stole the body, or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these facts. And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and therefore was who he claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. And thus, we have a good inductive argument for the existence of God based on the resurrection of Jesus. Finally, number five, God can be personally known and experienced. This isn't really an argument for God's existence. Rather, it's the claim that you can know that God exists wholly apart from arguments simply by personally experiencing him. This was the way that people in the Bible knew God. As Professor John Hick explains, God was known to them as a dynamic will, interacting with their own wills, a sheer given reality, as inescapably to be reckoned with as destructive storm and life-giving sunshine. To them, God was not an idea adopted by the mind, but an experienced reality which gave significance to their lives. Now, if this is the case, then there's a real danger that arguments for God's existence could actually distract our attention from God himself. If you're sincerely seeking God, then God will make his existence evident to you. The Bible promises, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We mustn't so concentrate on the external proofs that we fail to hear the inner voice of God speaking to our own heart. For those who listen, God becomes an immediate reality in their lives. In conclusion, then, I think we've seen five good reasons to think that God exists. God is the best explanation of the origin of the universe. God is the best explanation for the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. God is the best explanation of objective moral values and duties in the world. God is the best explanation of the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And God can be personally known and experienced. Now, if Michael wants us to believe that God does not exist, then he must first tear down all five of the reasons that I've presented, and then in their place erect a case of his own to show that God does not exist. Unless, and until he does that, I think that we can conclude that theism is the more plausible worldview. Uh, good evening. Well, let me uh, begin by expressing uh, some appreciation. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm very grateful to uh, Rachel Christie for uh, the invitation to take part in tonight's debate. 
and grateful to Brendan Helms in particular for all his work in organizing it. Uh, indeed, indeed delighted to take part, especially since Dr. William Lane Craig is participating as well. So I look forward to a very uh, interesting debate tonight. Um, let me begin. Uh, first, theism, atheism, the concept of God. God is by definition omnipotent, that is all powerful, omniscient, all knowing, morally perfect, immaterial, a person, and the creator of the physical universe. Theism is the view that God so defined exists. Atheism is the view that God so defined does not exist. So next, the central argument for atheism, the argument from evil. I'm going to be offering tonight a version of that central argument. In particular, I'll be setting out what is known as an inductive or evidential or probabilistic version of the argument from evil. Moreover, I'll be setting out a very specific version of that argument. Uh, first then, logical incompatibility versus evidential versions of the argument from evil. Some versions of the argument from evil, known as logical incompatibility versions, attempt to establish the following very strong claim. There are facts about undesirable states of affairs in the world that are logically incompatible with the existence of God. I am not putting forward that type of argument, and so I'm not defending the above thesis. The thesis that I'm defending is associated instead with what are known as inductive, or evidential, or probabilistic versions of the argument from evil. And the thesis in question is then as follows. There are facts about undesirable states of affairs in the world that make it unlikely indeed extremely unlikely uh, that God exists. So next, different versions of the probabilistic or evidential argument from evil. Uh, philosophers have put forward different versions and the differences between alternative versions of that argument are moreover very important. The reason is that some versions of that argument, such as those offered by the philosopher William Rowe, are in my opinion unsound. My version is the one I advanced in the recently published volume, Knowledge of God, which I co-authored with Professor Alvin Planning of Notre Dame, uh, published in 2008. A full presentation of that argument would require a lecture in itself, since the argument involves a serious and technical application of inductive logic. The underlying intuitive idea, however, is a very natural one, and that is what I should be setting out and explaining to you tonight uh, in this debate. So that's the structure of my discussion. I'm going to begin with a brief catalog of some important evils. Then I'll go on to offer a statement of the evidential argument from evil. Next, I'll talk about the justification of the crucial inductive inference. And then uh, my conclusion will be this. The inductive argument from evil for the non-existence of God is an inductively sound argument. So next then, a brief catalog of some important evils. First of all, there's extreme moral evil. Consider Hitler, Stalin, acts of genocide. Secondly, there's the suffering endured by innocent children due to starvation, serious illness, abuse by adults. There's the suffering of animals due, for example, to the existence of carnivores. There's the suffering that adults endure as a result of terrible diseases. Think of cancer, Alzheimer's, and so on. There's the suffering that results from natural evils, such as tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes, etc. Consider, for example, the 2004 tsunami in Southeast Asia, which killed over 200,000 people, or the recent earthquake in Haiti. There are deaths due to poverty-related causes. These amount to about 18 million a year, or about 300 million since 1990. There are defects in human beings that contribute greatly to human suffering and unhappiness. For example, the following. There's the human spine. Breakdown of disc leads to serious pain and disability. Women are more susceptible to lung cancer than men because of a gene that women have and men do not. There are declining hormone levels that accompany aging, leading to osteoporosis, broken bones, and so on. There are serious weaknesses in the body's defense mechanisms for dealing with bacteria and viruses. There's the use of pain to warn of danger to one's body, and more pain that cannot be turned off when it's useless, as in the case of terminal illnesses. There's the fact that humans are sexually mature long before they are emotionally mature. There's the tenuousness of moral knowledge, that is the fact that the moral intuitions of people differ dramatically on extremely important matters. There's the fragility of conscience, that is the fact that people often find it far too easy to perform actions 
that they believe are morally wrong. There's the absence of well-developed ability to think critically. There's the physical and mental deterioration that accompanies aging. And then finally, there's death, which is a very bad way to end your life. <laughs> okay, then there are defects in the world outside of human beings that contribute greatly to suffering, either by humans or uh, by other sentient beings. These include, as mentioned before, carnivorous animals and uh, an earth that's prone to natural disasters such as droughts, hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis. Next, I want to talk about three kinds of what I call hypothetical evils. The first type are evils that exist if there is an all-powerful and all-knowing being. So suppose the world does contain such a being. Then given the assumption the following states of affairs exist and seem to me to be highly undesirable. First, there's the hiddenness of such a being. This is the fact that the existence of any all-powerful, all-knowing being is to put it mildly, much less evident than it could be. Such a being could, after all, easily make his existence perfectly evident to anyone in a wide variety of ways. Instead, what we have is a world where, for example, as was shown by the large-scale study of the therapeutic effects of intercessory prayer in 2006, there is no evidence at all for the existence of a deity who intervenes in the world to answer prayers for the healing of others. Next, there's the silence of such a being. Consider, for example, the silence of an omnipotent and omniscient being about, first of all, why he has allowed great natural disasters such as the Haitian earthquake, or why he allowed Hitler to kill six million Jews, men, women, children, and babies in the Holocaust. Second type of hypothetical evils. These are evils that exist if the Old Testament is true. If the Old Testament is true, then we find that Yahweh, the supposed creator of the universe, has engaged in a large number of apparently heinously evil actions. To mention just three of many, Yahweh is described as killing off all non-human animals and all human beings, men, women, children, and babies, except for those animals in the family of one man, Noah, who were on an ark. Secondly, Yahweh is described at one point as killing the firstborn children of every Egyptian family. Thirdly, Yahweh is described as ordering Saul to kill all of the Amalekites, quote, Spare no one, put them all to death, men and women, children and babes in arms, 1 Samuel 15, 3. Third type of hypothetical evil. These are evils that exist if the New Testament is true. What I want to focus upon here is simply the existence of hell. The Old Testament is clearly a disaster area, but in my opinion, it's nothing compared with the New. There we find the belief that a supposedly loving and merciful creator of the universe has, as part of his creation, created hell, where according to the New Testament, the majority of the human race will suffer in eternal torment. Look at your neighbor. One of you is going there. Quote, the Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and throw them into the furnace of fire. Their men shall weep and gnash their teeth. Quote, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those that find it are few. Okay, next then, the evidential argument from evil. Here's how the argument goes. If there is an all-powerful, all-knowing being... Then there are cases where that person, the person intentionally allows natural disasters such as tsunamis and earthquakes that kill hundreds of thousands of innocent people, including children. Secondly, the property of intentionally allowing such natural disasters is a wrong-making characteristic of an action and a very serious one. Three, in many such cases, we do not know of any right-making characteristics that we have good reason to believe are both present in the cases in question and also sufficiently significant to counterbalance the relevant wrong-making characteristics. Therefore, four, if there's an all-powerful, all-knowing being, then there are specific cases of such a being's intentionally allowing natural disasters where there is a wrong-making property that is not, as far as we know, 
counterbalanced by right-making properties. Here comes the crucial inference. It's a probabilistic inference. Therefore, it's likely that if there is an all-powerful and all-knowing being, then there are specific cases of such a being is intentionally allowing disasters where the total wrong-making properties of the actions, both the known ones and the unknown ones, are not counterbalanced by the total right-making properties, both known and unknown. That's the crucial move in the argument. Six, an action is morally wrong, all things considered, if it has wrong-making characteristics that are not counterbalanced by its right-making characteristics. And therefore, seven, if there's an all-powerful and all-knowing being, then that being knowingly allows things to happen in situations where it is morally wrong to do so, all things considered. But eight, if one knowingly allows things to happen in situations where it's morally wrong to do so, then one is not morally perfect. And therefore, nine, there is no omnipotent, omniscient, and morally perfect being. But if God exists, then he is by definition omnipotent, omniscient, and morally perfect. And therefore, 11, God does not exist. That's the evidential argument from evil. All the inferences in the preceding argument are deductively valid inferences, except for the following one. It's the move from four to it's likely that five. It's moved from a claim about the right-making, wrong-making characteristics that we're aware of to a claim uh, that's relative to uh, the totality of right-making and wrong-making characteristics. That's the crucial inference. And the question is, is that inference justified or not? How can one determine whether that's so or not? The answer is, this can only be determined by bringing inductive logic, understood as the theory of logical probability, to bear upon the question. There is no other way of answering this question. Now, doing this turns out to be a somewhat complex operation that I cannot describe in detail here tonight. But if you're interested, the details are available in the aforementioned Knowledge of God book co-authored with Professor Alvin Planninger. What I'm going to do here is simply to convey the general intuitive idea behind the argument to enable you to see why you would suspect without looking at the details that this sort of argument is inductively sound. The general idea involves considering the different possibilities there are with regard to morally significant properties that we humans are not aware of. One then works out the probability in action that is wrong relative to those morally significant properties that we are aware of will also be morally wrong relative to the totality of morally significant properties, both known and unknown. Now, I'm going to illustrate the general idea by focusing upon an especially simple case. And so the case, it'll be helpful to use the following diagram. So let me explain what's going on in this diagram. You see that there's a rectangle with an A in it. The rectangle represents an action. Notice that there's a vertical line in the diagram, and the idea is that actions which are on the right side of the vertical line are morally right actions. Actions which are on the left side of the line are morally wrong actions. There's also a horizontal line in the diagram, and that's supposed to be the vision between things that are known about the action by us, they're above the line, and below the line are things that we don't know about, about the action. So again, looking at the diagram, you see an arrow above the line pointing to the left, and it's labeled KW. That's saying it's a known wrong-making property. It's pointing in the direction of moral wrongness. Below the line, you have an arrow pointing to the right, labeled UR. That's an unknown right-making property. And the idea in this case is that the unknown right-making property is more significant, is weightier, than the known wrong-making property. And so the result is that the action is one that's morally permissible, all things considered. Consider now an action A that's as follows. A has one known wrong-making property, and it has no known right-making properties. But there is an unknown right-making property, R, that A may or may not have. There's also an unknown wrong-making property, W, that A may or may not have. A's having the right-making property R is precisely as likely as A's having the wrong-making property W. 
The two properties, R and W, is precisely as weighty as one another. One can see there are four possibilities which are as follows. First possibility, action A doesn't have either R or W. Possibility two, A possesses R but not W. Possibility three, A possesses W but not R. And possibility four, A possesses both R and W. So here's a picture of the first possibility. Again, A doesn't have I, R, or W, it has a known wrong-making property, so A turns out to be wrong, all things considered. Second possibility is it possesses R but not W, when an unknown right-making property R shifts A across the vertical line into an action that's morally permissible. That's possibility two. Possibility three is it has the unknown wrong-making property but not the unknown right-making property. Now action A remains wrong but is even more wrong than it would otherwise be. Final possibility, action A has both the unknown right-making property and the unknown wrong-making property. They're equally weighty and cancel one another out, so action A is still wrong uh, and to the same degree. So what's the conclusion for this very special case of one apparent evil? First of all, in three of the four possibilities set out in diagrams one through four, action A is morally wrong, all things considered. So action A is three times as likely to be morally wrong as to be morally permissible. Secondly, one can also ask about the expected moral states of action A. That is, well, how right or wrong action A is on average. What's the answer to that question? The answer is it's possible to prove the following very important theorem. The expected moral value of action A, the moral value is equal to the moral value of action A has relative to the totality of known right-making and wrong-making properties. Well, so far, we've just been considering a special case. Can one prove any general theorem? The answer is that one can do this by applying inductive logic. So let A be some action of allowing some state affairs such that judged only on the basis of known moral and different properties, it would be morally wrong to allow action, to perform action A. What sorts of conclusions can one draw? The answer is that one can arrive at two very important conclusions. The first is that the expected moral value of action A is precisely equal to the moral value that action A has relative to the totality of known right-making and wrong-making properties. The second conclusion is the probability that action A is morally wrong given all moral and certain properties, both known and unknown, is greater than one half. What's the effect if you consider more than one apparent evil? The answer is as follows. Suppose that there are any events, each of which is such that judged simply by known right-making and wrong-making properties, it would be morally wrong to allow that event. Then the probability that none of those events is such that it's morally wrong to allow that event, judged in the light of all right-making and wrong-making properties, both known and unknown, must be less than the fraction 1 over n plus 1. So the upshot is that by considering n apparent evils, one can show the probability that God exists must be less than the fraction of 1 over n plus 1. But the number of apparent evils in the world is extremely large. Remember my catalog. And so n is extremely large. Consequently, the probability that God exists is extremely low. Seven, some of the clever but unsound moves of Bill. Over years of the base of the existence of God, Bill has developed a series of clever maneuvers that he uses to fool audiences and to attempt, sometimes successfully, to fool his opponents. Hmm. During this debate, I will alert you to the more important ones so that you won't be taken in tonight. So let me mention four clever maneuvers uh, that Bill has often employed in the past when his opponent sets up a probabilistic or evidential version of the argument from evil. Number one, in an early debate I had with him, Bill responded as follows. Number one, nor is no it's actually true. Dr. Tooley would have to prove it to be necessarily true. You see, otherwise there are possible worlds which are exactly like this one, with exactly the same evils occurring in them, and yet in those worlds, God justly uh, permits them. This reply is simply unsound. The inductive argument from evil does not claim that such worlds are impossible. What it does is demonstrate uh, that it's unlikely that our world is such a world. Unsound move number two. Um, another of his uh, maneuvers involves uh, putting forward assertions that beg the very question under issue. Um, since they assume that God exists, here are two examples from one of his early debates. Mankind is in the state of rebellion against God and his purpose. The knowledge of God spills over into eternal life. 
Uh, these statements cannot be true unless God exists. The bill is simply begging the question that advances such statements and responding to the argument from evil. Third one, puts forward claims, but claims he's not shown are likely to be true. Again, those two same statements uh, illustrate that. And so the idea is that Bill wants to appeal to natural life, for example. The mere assertions are no good. He has to show that those are likely and not mere possibilities. Uh, the final thing is uh, he sometimes says that one needs to prove various things, right? Uh, the argument I put forward does not involve any assumptions, for example, about there being not being an afterlife. Uh, it makes no claim of those sorts of things. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, I told you, you were in for a challenging evening. <laughs> Dr. Tooley's main argument for atheism is that the evil in the world renders God's existence improbable. I disagree. I think that given the Christian concept of God, it's not at all improbable that God and the evil in the world should coexist. So before I address Dr. Tooley's specific argument, let me say a word about uh, evil and suffering in general from a Christian point of view. I want to share with you three aspects of the Christian doctrine of God which increase the probability of the coexistence of God and evil. And Dr. Tooley has already mentioned two of those in warning you about me. But notice that this isn't invalid to do this. What I'm saying is that if the Christian God is the God at issue, then it is not at all improbable that we should see evil in the world. So what are those? Well, number one, the purpose of life is not happiness, but rather the knowledge of God. One reason that the problem of evil seems so uh, intractable is that we tend to think that if God exists, then his goal for human life is happiness in this life. God's role is to provide a comfortable environment for his human pets. But on the Christian view, this is false. We are not God's pets. And the purpose of life is not human happiness in this life, but rather a personal relationship with God, which will in the end bring true and everlasting human fulfillment. Many evils, such as Dr. Tooley cataloged, occur in life, which may be utterly pointless with respect to producing happiness in this life but they may not be pointless with respect to producing the knowledge of God. It is not at all improbable that only in a world suffused with natural and moral evils that the optimal number of persons would freely come to know God personally and so find eternal life. What the atheist would have to show is that there's another possible world which is feasible for God to create which involves less suffering than the actual world, but the same amount of the knowledge of God. But how could the atheist possibly prove such a thing? It's pure speculation. Secondly, on the Christian view, mankind is in a state of rebellion against God and his purpose. Rather than submit to and worship God, people rebel against God, go their own way, and so find themselves alienated from God and morally guilty before him. The terrible human evils in the world are testimony to man's depravity in this state of spiritual alienation. This only serves to heighten mankind's moral responsibility before God, as well as our own wickedness and our need of his forgiveness and moral cleansing. Thus, the Christian isn't surprised at the terrible moral evil in the world. On the contrary, given his worldview, he expects it. Thirdly, the knowledge of God flows over into eternal life. In the Christian view, this life is not all there is. Jesus promised eternal life to all who would place their trust in him as Savior and Lord. And in the afterlife, God will reward those who have borne their suffering and courage and trust with a life of unspeakable joy. The Apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, lived a life of incredible suffering. And yet he wrote these words, we do not lose heart, for this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. 
For we look to the things that are unseen, not to the things that are seen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Here, Paul imagines, as it were, a scale in which all of the sufferings of this life are placed on one side, and on the other side is placed the glory that God will bestow upon his children in heaven. And he says the, the weight of glory is so great that the sufferings of this life cannot even be compared to it. Moreover, think about this. The longer we spend in eternity, the more the sufferings of this life shrink by comparison to an infinitesimal moment. And that's why Paul could call them a slight, momentary affliction. They were simply overwhelmed by the ocean of divine joy and uh, eternity that God lavishes on those who trust him. So what I'm saying is that given the Christian doctrine of God, it's not at all improbable that we would find ourselves in a world filled with natural and moral evil. And therefore, the existence of the Christian God is not improbable relative to the evils in the world that Dr. Tooley cataloged. Now, what about Dr. Tooley's specific argument based on the evil in the world? Well, I think that his argument has multiple weaknesses. First, in general, although this didn't come out in his first speech, Dr. Tooley's argument is based upon a theory of logical probability which is highly controverted and irrelevant to real-life situations. His premise eight, I believe, I'm not sure about the numbering, it went by so quickly, namely the premise that the probability of the wrong-making properties of an action's outweighing its right-making properties is greater than a half, that premise is based upon a theory of probability which is rejected by almost all probability theorists today, in part because the probability that it, that it yields uh, depends upon arbitrary decisions made by the theorist and therefore are not objective. There are many other approaches to probabilistic reasoning which do not share the failings of Dr. Tooley's approach, but these do not support his key premise. Secondly, Consider Dr. Tooley's second premise, that if the action of choosing to permit some state of affairs is morally wrong, then God would never perform that action. I want to challenge this premise on two grounds. First, whether some action is wrong depends on the person involved. For example, it would be wrong for a mother to allow her child to throw a tantrum in the grocery store. She should discipline her child. But it wouldn't be wrong for you to allow her child to throw a tantrum. Indeed, it would be wrong for you to try to interfere and discipline her child because you don't have the right to do that. So we always need to ask, wrong for whom? And this is crucial because God, I think, has the right to do or permit things that we don't. For example, it would be wrong for Dr. Tooley to pull out a gun and kill me. But if God wants to end my life right now, that's his prerogative. So Dr. Tooley's first premise, I think, is malformed and therefore cannot be true. Second reason I have for doubting this premise is that I don't think naturalism can make sense of moral rightness and wrongness. Rightness and wrongness have to do with our moral obligations and prohibitions, but these arise as a result of moral imperatives. As we saw in my defense of the moral argument, Atheists can make no sense of moral imperatives because they lack a moral lawgiver to issue such imperatives. And that's why on atheism there are no objective moral duties. So Dr. Tooley's premise only makes sense if God exists. So his argument against God's existence presupposes God's existence. And therefore it can't even get off the ground. Thirdly, consider Dr. Tooley's premise six, that the property of choosing not to prevent an event like the Haitian earthquake is a wrong-making property of the, that action. Now, Dr. Tooley just takes this premise for granted, but I don't think it's clearly true. And again, I have two reasons for this. First, even though the event of all those people dying is horrible and even bad, it doesn't follow from that that it was wrong for God to permit it to happen. Badness doesn't entail wrongness. But secondly, more fundamentally, we shouldn't think of the rightness or wrongness of an action as a sum 
of right-making and wrong-making properties. Consider the property of sticking a knife into somebody's heart. That might seem like a wrong-making property. But suppose we're given the additional information that the agent involved is a heart surgeon. Well, now suddenly, it no longer seems to be a wrong-making property after all. Being a heart surgeon, however, is not a right-making property that balances out the wrong-making property of sticking a knife into somebody. Rather, it's a context in which we now see that what we thought was a wrong-making property may not have been wrong after all and may even be good. If it's right for someone to permit some event, then his action is just right as a whole. It doesn't make sense to think of the wrongness of an action as a sum of known and unknown right and wrong-making properties, as Dr. Tooley does in his argument. Fourthly, and finally, consider Dr. Tooley's premise four, that we know of no right-making property of the action that would outbalance the known wrong-making property. Now, I've already rejected this whole approach to assessing the worth of uh, actions, but waiving that, on the view that I've defended, I do know of such a property. On my view, the wrongness of an action is determined by its being forbidden by God. An action is morally permissible if it is not forbidden by God. Now, obviously, God didn't forbid permitting the Haitian earthquake. So it has the right-making property of being permitted by God. So Dr. Tooley has to just assume that my view is unjustified, which is what he's supposed to be proving. His argument turns out to be reasoning in a circle. So for those four reasons, it seems to me that Dr. Tooley's argument, despite, uh, despite its complexity, has at least three false premises. It's therefore, I think, a bad argument for atheism. Now, let me just respond very quickly to his points, four points, that if God exists, there are certain evils. First, the hiddenness of God. He would have to show that if God made his existence more evident, that more people would come to a personal knowledge and relationship with him. And that is by no means obvious. That's purely conjectural. Secondly, with regard to the silence of God, again, this would turn the universe into a haunted house if God were to be telling us every time why we fell down the stairs or had an automobile accident. And besides, it might not do any good. People learning that the reason God permitted it was because it would help someone 75 years from now in Catalan, Mexico, just make, might make them all the more angry and resentful against God. What about the Old Testament uh, atrocities, as he calls them? This is really an attack on biblical inerrancy, not relevant to tonight's debate. So I'm going to just simply leave that aside as an irrelevance. And as for the New Testament doctrine of hell, I would simply say that the New Testament teaches that God wants everyone to be saved and go to heaven. The only reason some people do not is because they freely separate themselves from God forever. So that the only reason there's anybody in hell is due to human uh, intransigence and refusal of uh, God's drawing them into this relationship with himself. It is not God's will that anyone be there. So in sum, then, I think that these arguments for evil are not as plausible as the reasons for theism, and therefore I think theism is the more plausible worldview. Okay, uh, Bill's many arguments for the existence of God. Over the years, Bill's offered a large number of arguments, at least ten in number, that he presents his arguments for God's existence. How many of those ten arguments or so are really arguments for the existence of God? This is a question to which I shall now turn, and I shall argue that many of Bill's arguments are not, in fact, arguments for the existence of God. So, six bad arguments that are not arguments for the existence of God. Here are the six arguments I have in mind. Uh, there's the version of the cosmological argument that says that since the physical universe cannot always have existed, it must have a non-physical cause. There's a teleological argument. God provides the best explanation of the complex order of the universe. There's the fine-tuning argument. 
God is the best explanation for the remarkable fine-tuning initial condition of the universe for initial life, intelligent life. This Big Bang cosmology, which appeals to uh, current cosmological theory uh, that the universe had a beginning, and so must have had an intelligent first cause. There's a contingency argument. God is the best explanation why anything at all exists rather than nothing. There's the abstract entities argument. Now, I'm going to look at one of the above arguments, but the point that I shall make are will apply equally to the other five arguments. So let's look at the fine-tuning argument. Bill describes the conclusion of this argument as follows. God is the best explanation for the remarkable fine-tuning of initial conditions of the universe for intelligent life. Note the presence of the word God. In fact, however, what the argument basically attempts to establish is that there was an intelligent, immaterial person who fine-tuned the laws and initial conditions of our universe for intelligent life. So considered, I believe that the argument is unsound. But discussion of that is beside the point. The relevant issue is this. How can one possibly get from the above conclusion to the conclusion that God exists? The answer is to do so when we need to prove the following premise. The existence of a fine tuner is all powerful, all knowing, and perfectly good, and therefore which is God, is more likely the existence of a fine tuner who either is not all powerful or not all knowing or not perfectly good. But in fact, that premise is false, as can be shown from the following absolutely fundamental equiprobability principle of inductive logic. Here it is. If you have two properties, P and, Q, P and Q, that belong to a family of incompatible properties, then the initial a priori probability that some particular thing has property P is precisely equal to the initial a priori probability that that thing has property Q. Let's see the application of that to the following families of properties. Consider the property being perfectly good, the property being morally indifferent to good and evil, and the property being perfectly evil. It follows that the following three hypotheses have the same initial probability. First, there's a fine tuner who is all powerful, all knowing, and perfectly good. Secondly, a fine tuner who is all powerful, all knowing, and morally indifferent to good and evil. And thirdly, a fine tuner is all powerful, all knowing, and perfectly evil. It therefore follows that the probability of the first of these hypotheses is true cannot be greater than that of either of the other two hypotheses. And so it cannot have a probability that's greater than one-third. The inference and conclusion that God exists is therefore unjustified, since that conclusion is more likely to be false than to be true. The situation is precisely parallel with regard to the other arguments. And the upshot is that as regards to the following three hypotheses, one, there's an all-powerful, all-knowing person who is perfectly good. Two, there's an all-powerful, all-knowing person who is morally indifferent to good and evil. And third, there's an all-powerful, all-knowing person who's perfectly evil. We can establish the following conclusions. Conclusion one, the probabilities of hypotheses one, two, and three relative to the combination of those arguments are precisely equal. So that none of the probabilities can be greater than one-third. And consequently, we have the following important conclusion two. The probability of the hypothesis that there's an all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfectly good person relative to the combination of arguments one, two, three, four, five, and six cannot be greater than one-third. These six arguments that Bill offers illustrate then another clever maneuver that he uses in debates on the existence of God. Call it clever move number five. What you do is you offer arguments that you describe as arguments for the existence of God that are not, in fact, arguments for God's existence, since they're not arguments for the existence of an all-powerful, all-knowing, and especially perfectly good person. Then when, but only when, your opponent points this out, you say that those arguments were only intended, of course, as part of some previously described and unmentioned cumulative case for the existence of God. There is no such cumulative case. Three, the resurrection of Jesus. This is argument seven. Here's Bill's characterization of the conclusion of this argument. God provides the best explanation for the historical facts concerning the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. Here's with the six arguments I've just considered. The problem is the conclusion uses the word God, but no premise that justifies the use of this term has ever been introduced, let alone defended. The conclusion that Bill's argument would support, if it were sound, would be this. There are good reasons for believing that Jesus, having died, was probably raised from the dead by some supernatural being or other. Now, if this were a debate on the resurrection, I would have to show why the argument for Proposition 1 is unsound. But this is a debate about the existence of God, as I've defined him at the beginning. Consequently, Bill needs to forge a connection between Proposition 1 
and the following claim. There are good reasons for believing that God, uh, that Jesus having died, was raised from the dead by God. Through that, he needs to offer reasons for concluding the following proposition is true. If Jesus was raised from the dead by a supernatural being, that being was an all-powerful, all-knowing, and morally perfect person. Until he does that, the resurrection of Jesus' argument is of no value at all as an argument for the existence of God. Four, the ontological argument. Uh, this is an argument that Bill has only recently begun to offer in debates. Uh, he didn't offer it tonight, but it's, the result is important to me. What is the ontological argument? The ontological argument takes the concept of God to be that of being that, in addition to being all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfectly good, is also a necessarily existent being. What you can show is that if it's possible for God so defined to exist, then God does exist. It's then claimed that it's possible that God exists, which uh, yields the conclusion uh, that God does exist. Is the ontological argument sound or not? The answer, and this is a view that almost all philosophers share, is that the argument is unsound. Here are two related ways in which one can see that it's unsound. First, there's a point made by Monty and Gaunilla, who was a contemporary of Anselm, who in turn set out the ontological argument. Gaunilla's point was that if one could prove the existence of God in that way, one could prove other exciting conclusions using perfectly parallel arguments. To use Gaunilla's example, one could prove the necessary existence of a perfect island. Some of us would prefer to prove the necessary existence of perfect beer along with perfect pizza or even a perfect teenager. Secondly, <laughs> Galileo's argument can be strengthened by knowing that using completely parallel arguments, one can also generate contradiction. Thus, one can prove, for example, both of the necessarily existent immovable object and also the necessarily existent irresistible force. Or to put things in terms of the present debate, you can prove the following contradictory conclusions. There's a necessarily existent being who's all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfectly good. There's a necessarily existent being who's all-powerful, all-knowing, and morally indifferent to good and evil. There's a necessarily existent being who's all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfectly evil. The above argument demonstrates that ontological arguments are unsound, since no type of argument that generates contradictory conclusions can possibly be sound. Conclusions. First, the ontological argument is sound, unsound. And secondly, and this I'll need later on, the concept of a necessarily existing entity, unlike the number seven, which is not an abstract, necessarily timeless object, is implicitly self-contradictory. Experience of God. Here's Bill's description of this argument. We can know that God exists through personally experiencing as a kind of properly basic belief in the same way I know the external world exists or that the past is real. I can know that God exists in the same sort of immediate non inferential way. This argument is unsound. I'll give you two informal points that show that. First of all, people around the world have very different religious experiences. Those religious experiences, moreover, have contents that are inconsistent with one another. Thus, a Muslim may have an experience according to which Muhammad is the most important human being who ever lived, whereas a Christian may have an experience according to which Jesus is the most important human who ever lived. The point here is that even if certain religious experiences could provide one with initial justification for some religious belief, that initial justification is undercut once one learns that other people have experiences that equally justify initially religious beliefs that are incompatible with your belief. The first point then is this, religious experiences lack in a subjectivity, and that provides a strong reason for thinking that one's own religious experiences do not correspond to objective reality. There's also a second very important point, and that's that the content of one's religious experiences are very strongly correlated with one's own religious beliefs. Catholic children, for example, sometimes have visions of the Virgin Mary, whereas Hindu and Muslim children never do. This correlation between one's religious views and the content of one's religious experiences is very strong evidence that such experiences are not ones that bring one into contact with objective reality. Um, the moral argument. This argument involves several crucial claims. I'm going to focus upon the following three. First claim, if God does not exist, it's impossible for objective moral values to exist. Claim two, states of affairs involving an all-powerful and all-knowing person are the truth makers and the only truth makers for basic ethical statements. Claim three, if it's morally wrong in itself for a person, it's wrong, morally wrong for in itself for a person to perform action A, if and only if God commands that person not to do A. 
Observation, Bill has not offered satisfactory support for any of those three claims, either here or in his publications. At this point, I'm going to comment only on Bill's first claim. I shall then address the other two claims in the next round. How then could one attempt to establish that God does not exist? It's impossible for objective moral values to exist. Answer, what one needs to do is to survey all the accounts that have been offered by philosophers who set out and defend non-theological accounts of the existence of objective values and demonstrate that none of those accounts are satisfactory. Two of my colleagues, for example, have written books setting out and defending such accounts. There's Graham Audi, Value, Really, Reality, and Desire, Michael Humer, Ethical Intuitionism. Other very well-known philosophers who have also defended the existence of objective values without any reference to theological concepts include Richard Boyd, David Brink, Christine Korsgaard, Peter Railton, Jeffrey Sayer McCord, Russ Shea, Philando, Nicholas Sturgeon. Both in debates in his articles, William Lane Craig does not discuss any of these philosophers, so I fear they must say that Bill seems to me at this point not to be fully honoring his intellectual and scholarly obligations. In his response, then, I would like to hear Bill describe some of the above approaches and tell us all exactly where they go wrong. Thank you very much. In my last speech, I explained why I wasn't convinced by Michael's argument based on the problem of evil, because it has three, I think, false premises. Are my arguments for God any better? Well, let's look at them. Uh, in objection to the cosmological, the teleological arguments, Michael doesn't dispute any of the premises, and therefore doesn't deny the conclusion of these arguments. So what these arguments give us is an uncreated, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, personal creator and designer of the universe uh, of, which has unfathomable power. Now what Michael complains is that you haven't shown, however, that this is a full-blown conception of God, that he's omnipotent, omniscient, morally perfect. Granted, but I'm working here with, I think, a common sense minimal definition of God. For example, in the famous uh, debate between Bertrand Russell and Frederick Copleston, Copleston said, by God, we mean a supreme personal being distinct from the world and the creator of the world. To which Bertrand Russell replied, I accept this definition. So I'm working with a concept of God here, I think, that is an acceptable and ordinary conception. Indeed, think about this, please. It would be a bizarre form of atheism for some atheist to say that he believes that there is a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, personal creator and designer of the universe who has unfathomable power, is the source of uh, absolute moral values, and raised Jesus from the dead. And yet that's the position that Michael would be defending this evening. So I think that I have demonstrated atheism, and especially when you take all of the arguments together, they do constitute a powerful cumulative case for, I think, a God uh, concept. Now, as for Dr. Tooley's argument uh, against these um, arguments being for God, he appealed precisely to that controverted theory of logical probability, which I disputed in my last statement. Let me say more about this. What is correct about Dr. Tooley's assertion, I think, is that in the complete absence of evidence, there is a sort of symmetry of ignorance about competing views. We'd have no idea which is true. But Dr. Tooley interprets this to mean that the competing options are all equally probable, and that's false. To see why, consider an illustration that's offered by the mathematician Peter Wally of a closed bag of colored marbles. If you reach in and pull out a marble, what's the probability that the marble will be red? Wally says, and I quote, a naive answer is to say that because there are two possible outcomes, red or non-red, and no information to favor either, the probability must be one-half. 
But one could apply the same principle to the colors blue and green instead of red, and they cannot each have the probability one half. Any precise assessment becomes quite arbitrary. So according to Wally, the correct answer is to say, I don't have any information at all about the chance of drawing a red marble, and I don't see why I should bet on or against, any, uh, against red at any odds. Wally then goes offer to, uh, on, to uh, offer a different theory of probability, which assigns not precise values to the different alternatives, but intervals. For example, in the absence of any information about the color of the marbles in the bag, the model assigns the vacuous probability of zero to one for drawing a red marble, which is just what it should be in a state of complete ignorance. So applied to the question of the existence of God, it means that in the absence of any evidence whatsoever, we simply should have no opinion about the issue in question. There certainly wouldn't be a presumption uh, such as Dr. Tooley imagines. So I think that uh, the arguments that I've given, the premises of which and the conclusions to which are undisputed, at least in the case of the first two, are good arguments for a personal creator and designer of the universe. What about the moral argument for God's existence? Here, Dr. Tooley says, uh, in response to the premise that without God there are no ob objective moral values and duties, that many philosophers defend theories of moral realism that are atheistic. Certainly they do, but I maintain that there's no good reason to think that those theories are true. They have an absence of explanatory power for the moral values and duties that they affirm. They typically just assume the, that human beings, for example, have intrinsic moral value. Shelley Kagan, in his book, The Limits of Morality, has said that this need for explanation in moral theory cannot be overemphasized. He says, one of the things we want our moral theory to help us to understand is how there can even be a moral realm and what kind of objective status it has. He says, unless we have a coherent explanation of our moral principles, we don't have a satisfactory ground for believing them to be true. So I would just ask Dr. Tooley to give us a moral theory that would offer some sort of explanatory ground for why we think human beings have, for example, intrinsic moral value or the moral duties that we do. Notice that if you adopt some sort of moral realism, which just says there are abstract moral values like justice or kindness or whatever, but that can't explain the nature of moral obligation. Uh, just because there are abstract moral values, there are also abstract moral vices like greed, rapacity, and hatred. What obligates me to align my life with one set of abstract values rather than another. I can't see any ground on naturalism for moral obligations or prohibitions because there isn't any person or authority to issue such moral imperatives. So it seems to me that in the absence of any sort of ground for affirming the uh, value of human beings and the presence of moral duties, it's more plausible on a naturalistic view to simply take these to be the socio-biological spin-offs of evolution uh, essentially illusions of moral grandeur on the part of homo sapiens on this planet. What about the resur well, and then of course it does follow, however, that if you do agree with me that certain things really are wrong, that there really is evil, for example, then it follows that God exists. What about the resurrection of Jesus? Here he says, the most that would follow from your argument is that Jesus was raised by some supernatural being or other. I would care to disagree. I think that given the historical context of the resurrection of Jesus, namely Jesus' own unparalleled life and claims and his execution for blasphemy, the most plausible explanation is that the supernatural being that raised Jesus from the dead was the God of Israel. Jesus proclaimed uh, that he was the absolute revelation of the God of Israel. And if Jesus has been miraculously raised from the dead, then given that historical context, I think it is the best explanation to say that the God of Israel has publicly vindicated Jesus of Nazareth by vindicating those uh, allegedly blasphemous claims for which he was crucified. Notice that Dr. Tooley didn't deny any of the three facts, the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, or the origin of the Christian faith, uh, so that I think that on the basis of the resurrection, we have good grounds for believing the God of Israel. Finally, as to personal experience, he says there are other experiences. 
But look, I'm not trying to deny, for example, Muslim experience. I think a Muslim is justified in believing uh, in God on the basis of experience unless there's a defeater for that. And I think there are defeaters for Islam. I think there are good reasons to think Islam is not true. But what is absent in tonight's debate is any good defeaters of the Christian view of God. In the absence of those defeaters, I think I'm perfectly rational to continue to believe in God on the basis of his personal reality in my life. So, let's look at the moral argument. In my first response, I point out the bill has not responded at all to the many philosophers who have advanced accounts of objective moral values that are incompatible with the following claim. If God does not exist, it's impossible for objective moral values to exist. I shall now consider two other crucial claims. Here, so we have two decisive objections to theologically based ethics. Argument one is the necessity of basic moral truths. This argument is directed against claim two, States' affairs involving the all-powerful and all-knowing person are the truth-makers and the only truth-makers for basic ethical statements. The argument runs as follows. First, basic moral truths are necessary truths. They are true in all possible worlds. Hence, the state affairs as cannot provide an ontological ground for moral truths unless it's a ground for moral truths in all possible worlds. In my early discussion of the ontological argument, I showed the assumption that it's logically possible for the B2 to be necessarily existent beings that exist in time gives rise to contradictions. We have then the following conclusion. Aside from timeless, purely abstract objects such as numbers, it's logically impossible for there to be necessarily existent beings. So if God is defined as a necessarily existent person, it follows that God does not exist. But if God is not a necessarily existent person, then there's got to be a possible world in which God fails to exist. But basic moral truths being necessary truths are true in every possible world. And so they must be true in possible worlds where God does not exist. If God does not exist in a given possible world, God cannot provide non-logical ground for basic moral truths in that world. Therefore, states affairs involving God cannot provide a non-logical ground for basic moral truths. Second argument, theologically based ethics is incompatible with objective moral wrongness. This argument is directed against claim three. It is morally wrong in itself for a person to perform action A if and only if God commands that person not to do A. The argument runs as follows. Inflicting suffering upon any sentient being is always wrong in itself. If claim three is true, then it's morally wrong in itself for a person to perform action A if and only if God commands that person not to do A. God does not command himself not to perform any actions, such as not inflicting suffering upon any sentient being. Therefore, if claim three is true, it's not wrong itself, for example, for God to inflict suffering upon any sentient being. Therefore, claim three is false. Bill's theologically based ethics entails, in short, that no action is objectively wrong, and so it entails that persons and sentient beings do not have any objective intrinsic rights. Thus, as Bill frankly puts it, referring to God, if you want to strike me dead right now, that's his prerogative. In the end, then, Bill's embracing a form of moral nihilism. The resurrection of Jesus argument. I point out earlier that in order to convert this argument into an argument for the existence of God, Bill would need to prove the following thesis. If Jesus was raised from the dead by a supernatural being, that being was all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfectly good. I shall now offer two arguments to you that even if it is perhaps not absolutely impossible that if Jesus was raised from the dead, he was raised from the dead by God, that is, by an all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfectly good person, the latter is very improbable. First, then, the moral character of Yahweh. The argument is, is as follows. If Jesus was raised from the dead, the most reasonable hypothesis about the supernatural being who did it was that it was a God that Jesus believed in, namely Yahweh, the God of the Jews. There are excellent reasons for believing that Yahweh, if he existed, was not perfectly good and therefore was not God. Therefore, three, there are excellent reasons for believing that Jesus was raised from the dead. He was not raised from the dead by God. 
Crucial claim here is two, so let me now indicate very briefly the type of sport that can be offered toward that premise. According to the Old Testament, Yahweh destroyed all life on earth in a great flood, including all men, women, and children, except for Noah's family and the animals on the ark. He killed all the firstborn Egyptian children. He ordered Saul to kill all the Amalekites, spare no one, put them all to death, men and women, children and babes in arms. He declared that people should be put to death for a long and exciting list of reasons, including striking one's mother or one's father, being a son who is uncontrollable, sacrificing to a deity other than Yahweh, being a woman who is not a virgin when she gets married, and many, many more. Finally, when we turn to the New Testament, we find that among Yahweh's creations is hell, a place of eternal torment, and second, that hell is where the majority of human beings will wind up spending eternity. Again, I quoted this before, but enter by the narrow gate, the gate is wide and the way is easy, it leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. The gate is narrow and the way is hard, it leads to life, and those that find it are few. The conclusion, in short, is the actions that are attributed to Yahweh, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, provide excellent evidence for the following conclusion. If Yahweh exists, it's extremely improbable that, there is anything other, that he is anything other than a profoundly evil deity unworthy of worship. Five, the beliefs and character of Jesus. My second argument concerns the following question. How likely is it that Jesus would be resurrected, not by an evil deity such as Yahweh, but by God, to find as an all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfectly good person? My answer is that given the beliefs and character of Jesus, that's very unlikely. First of all, Jesus had a number of false beliefs about the world, including a belief in demonic possession, and perhaps most strikingly, a belief concerning his supposed second coming, which he claimed would take place very soon after his death. Quote, but the Son of Man is to come in the glory of his Father with the angels, and they will give each man the due reward for what he has done. I tell you this, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they've seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. There are many, many verses related to that. Secondly, Jesus had some very unsound moral beliefs. For example, Jesus accepted the Old Testament teaching that the man who curses his father or mother must suffer death. Thirdly, Jesus did not disapprove of a world where he thought that most of mankind were going to be tormented forever in hell, a fact that points to a serious defect in the character of Jesus, since it betrays an enormous uh, lack of humanity. In addition, Jesus exhibited a very vindictive attitude towards anyone who questioned his teachings. Quote, If anyone will not receive you or listen to what you say, then as you leave that house or town, shake the dust of it off your feet. I tell you, this, on the day of judgment, it will be more bearable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Would an all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfectly good God resurrect a person with such false beliefs about the world, or with such badly mistaken moral beliefs, or with the character was vindictive and viewed uh, as morally acceptable a world where the majority of the human race would be confined to ever to a place of torment from which there was no escape or relief? My answer is that I believe it's very unreasonable to believe that an all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfectly good God would raise such a person from the dead. Thank you. In my closing statement, I'd like to draw together some of the threads in this debate and see if we can come to some conclusions. I argued tonight for one basic contention, that the arguments for theism are better than the arguments for atheism. Is that the case? Well, that depends upon the arguments for theism and atheism that have been offered. What about the arguments for atheism tonight? Well, unfortunately, Dr. Tooley hasn't responded to any of my critiques of his arguments. So, Given that I have argued on the basis of four different principles that it has at least three false premises in it, uh, we can't conclude that there have been any good arguments offered for atheism tonight. And, of course, I'm not going to have a chance to further respond to anything he says in his final statement. So I think we have to conclude uh, 
that there have been no good arguments given for atheism tonight. What about my arguments for theism? Dr. Tooley hasn't disputed the cosmological argument or the teleological argument. Neither did he respond to my defense of thinking these to be significant arguments for theism. Remember, we said it would be a very bizarre form of atheism to grant the conclusions of these arguments. And in fact, in his last speech, Dr. Tooley seemed to be willing to go so far as to grant that the Bible, the biblical God exists, that the God of the Bible exists, but he just wouldn't regard that God as being a good God and therefore not perfectly uh, good and omniscient and omnipotent and the rest. Well, I'm almost tempted to say, well, I'm just going to content myself with having demonstrated that the God of the Bible exists. And uh, if he doesn't like that God, well, he can take that up with God. But uh, it seems to me that having demonstrated that, I've done all that is required of me. Um, what about the moral argument for God's existence? Here, in his last speech, Dr. Tooley's defense came down to saying that a necessary being cannot exist in time. But I, here I have to apologize. I missed the argument for that. I heard him assert that seven is timeless, the number seven, and God is not. But I didn't see why that was a demonstration that God can't be metaphysically necessary. Indeed, God is timeless without the universe. But I think when he creates the universe, he enters into time. And I don't see any reason that would affect the necessity of God's being. Dr. Tooley also says that um, it is always wrong to uh, inflict suffering on a person. But I already disputed that in my response to his argument. I said that wrongness is person relative and that indeed God does have the right to inflict suffering and death uh, on us if he should choose to. God is the author and the giver of life. And if he chooses to take life, that's his prerogative. He doesn't have the same moral obligations that we do. Indeed, I would say that God doesn't have any moral duties at all because he doesn't issue commands to himself. Does that mean God can just will anything? No. He is constrained by his own nature as a being who is essentially good, kind, compassionate, fair. He could not will, for example, that hatred be good and love be evil. He could not will that we should have other gods before him and worship them. His essential nature constrains his commands. Finally, Dr. Tooley in uh, attack, uh, well, then let's turn to the resurrection of Jesus. Here, his argument is purely philosophical, not historical. He says the moral character of Yahweh is such that Jesus couldn't have been raised by a, a, a perfectly good God, perhaps the God of Israel, as I've argued, but not a perfectly good God. Well, it seems to me that what this is an argument against is against biblical inerrancy. It's against taking the Old Testament to be an inerrant record of the exploits of the God of Israel. And a person who doesn't believe in biblical inerrancy could simply say, I don't accept that. I, I, I don't accept some of these characterizations. More than that, however, he, he takes things like God's destroying people as indicative of Yahweh's being evil, and I don't think that follows at all. I think God has the right to give and take life as he chooses fit. Most of the examples he gave were examples of God uh, punishing people in judgment, and this is a demonstration of God's righteousness, which is God's goodness. Um, moreover, many of those laws that he mentioned were restricted to a theocratic society and have no applicability today because we don't live in a theocracy. So they're just irrelevant. The doctrine of hell, I've already answered that by saying that God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. People separate themselves freely from God irrevocably, and God respects that decision. He says Jesus had many false beliefs like the time of his return. I don't think that you can prove Jesus expected him to return in his own lifetime or the lifetime of those around him. Indeed, many of Jesus' parable, parables predict a considerable delay. The master will be delayed in his return. And Jesus said no one knows the time of his return, not even himself. As for hell, certainly Jesus did warn people about hell. He warned people not to separate themselves from God but to turn to God in repentance and faith so that they could be forgiven of their sin and their moral evil, which separates them from him. So, in sum, tonight I don't think we've any, heard any good reasons to think that God does not exist. We've certainly heard a number of good reasons to think the God of the Bible exists. And for that reason, I remain enthusiastically a Christian philosopher. Thank <laughs> you.
let me begin by commenting very briefly on the main move that uh, Bill has made. When I defined God initially, there was no voice of protest. When I argue, offered the argument from evil, there was no voice of protest. But if you shift to a minimal definition of God as just the supernatural creator and so on, right, then the argument from evil is completely irrelevant, right? And that's the grounds on which you dismiss it. Uh, it seems to me that if one shows, you know, there's a being who's uh, creator, and it turns out that being is perfectly evil, uh, that doesn't really uh, respond to one's religious and other concerns and so on. It gives one no guarantee that, indeed, that justice is going to be done, that in the end that good will triumph and so on. So I think that I was arguing about you're focusing on the classical conception of God, according to which God is perfectly good, and that Bill has shifted away from that simply to avoid the force of my arguments. So, uh, the inductive argument from evil. Uh, there are a number of responses that Bill typically makes. Uh, again, he appealed to Christian beliefs, ignoring my point that that, first of all, begs the question. And then secondly, he doesn't offer any evidence, so those beliefs are likely to be true. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show that none of these is a satisfied response to my version of the argument from evil. I'll skip over some of the stuff to get to other stuff that's more important. He didn't appeal to skeptical theism. Um, so the question is this. How does one apply inductive logic to the argument? Um, well, again, one has to ask, what is the basis of inductive logic? And the answer was sound equiprobability principles. Now, here's the crucial point, and this is one that Bill does not address at all. The very same equiprobability principle that I use in my formal justification of the crucial inductive step in my formulation of the argument from evil is the precise principle that one must use if one is to solve the problem of justifying induction. Uh, question that step in the argument then. And the result is as follows. You have no escape from the worst form of skepticism of all, skepticism of induction. Um, now, the only one on contemporary Christian philosopher who is at least somewhat knowledgeable about inductive logic is Richard Swinburne. At a conference in Levan, Belgium last summer, I read a paper setting out my formal version of the inductive argument from evil. Swinburne agreed that the inductive part of the argument is sound. I do not want to put it harshly, but Bill and other theists really need to do their homework here. They need to study inductive logic in a serious way and then work their way through my formal statement of the inductive argument from evil. Bill and his discussion attribute various premises to me that are not part of the argument I set out at all. That argument is a deductively valid argument except for one step, and all the premises, I think, are sound. Um, so, um, Bill appealed to things like the Christian faith entails doctrines increase the probability of coexistence of God and evil. And the problem is that what the Christian faith entails is completely irrelevant to inductive versions of the argument from evil unless it can be demonstrated that it's likely that Christianity is true. Here, Bain would think that by arguing the resurrection of Jesus, he's shown that Christianity is true. But in the first place, Bill's argument can be shown to be unsuccessful. In the second place, Christianity involves false beliefs and failed predictions mentioned before, demonic possession, failed prediction of the second coming of Jesus, failed prediction of power of faith healing that Christians are supposed to possess, a failed prediction of the power of intercessory prayer. Consider, for example, the following passage. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name will have cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They pick up serpents. They drink any deadly thing. It will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. In the third place, the things between all powerful, all knowing, and perfectly good God and the God of Christianity is again crucial. He, at last, as I showed tonight, it's highly improbable that Yahweh, the Old Testament, or the Christian God who created hell is perfectly good. Any reasons that are offered to think that Christianity is true are therefore reasons for thinking the universe was created by a deity who was certainly not God. Response three, arguments for God's existence. Let me skip over this. Um, arguments from religious experience uh, certainly won't do the job to block uh, the argument from evil. Uh, neither will the sorts of arguments that Bill uh, relies upon. Uh, and so they will not defeat the uh, argument from evil. Uh, arguments that may seem promising, and now the logical argument, the moral argument. Uh, I also demonstrated tonight that both of those arguments are open to decisive reputations. My views in this matter, moreover, are in no way idiosyncratic. Very few contemporary philosophers, indeed, uh, think that either the ontological argument or moral argument is a sound argument, and with very good reasons that I have shown. Summing up, the inductive version of the argument from evil that I set out tonight is a sound inductive argument. Uh, the responses that Bill, Bill has made to it are totally without merit. Uh, 
thirdly, as I've shown, not just the arguments that Bill has set out tonight, but absolutely all the arguments for God's existence that Bill defends are unsound. The collusion, accordingly, is clear. It's been shown that it's highly unlikely that God exists. Thank you. Okay, we want to take this time now to uh, go to questions and answers. Let me just remind you that if you have a question for Dr. Craig, you want to line up at this microphone here. If you have a question for Dr. Tooley at this microphone here, we will alternate questions for the debaters, beginning with Dr. Craig. Each debater will be given two minutes to respond to the question. The other debater will have one minute for a counter response. If maybe we might need it. And I understand we're going to take about a half an hour, Mr. Helms. About a half an hour for Q&A, which means it's possible that you could be standing in line for the entire half hour and not get your question asked. So just be prepared for that eventuality. That's bound to happen, I suppose. Yes. Two minutes for the response, one minute for the counter response. Are you going to do the timing on that, too? Okay. Are you ready, Dr. Craig? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Tooley? Yes. Okay. We'll begin over here. Please, sir. Your question for Dr. Craig. Um, hi. My name hi. is Javen. Uh, my, my question is, well, your first point was the cosmological argument, which that there must be a first cause and that God is the first cause. Um, doesn't this just extend the problem because then you must ask where God came from and what was the cause of said God? Okay, and good so, question. Okay, go ahead. Notice the first premise. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Something cannot come into being out of nothing. It can't come into being without a cause. But something which is eternal, which exists without beginning, wouldn't need to have a cause. And this isn't special pleading for God, because this is what the atheist has always said about the universe. The universe is eternal and uncaused, and therefore there doesn't need to be an explanation. But my argument is that for both philosophical and scientific reasons, we now have good grounds for thinking that the universe did begin to exist, and that points to its ground in a timeless cause which never began to exist. Dr. Tooley, a minute response. Right. Uh, what's happening here is that Bill uh, appeals to a very restricted version of the causal principle. Uh, it's one that deals with things coming into existence. But consider something electron at a given moment, right? Uh, the electron doesn't come into existence at that moment, but its existence at that time has a cause in ter terms of earlier existence of states of that electron. So a correct principle will say that whenever you have a temporally located state of affairs, uh, it's reasonable to believe that there is a necessary causal condition of that sort of thing, right? Now, I would maintain that anything that's caused or really doing anything else has temporal location. And so if God causes the universe, then God, so to speak, is in time, right? And so then a non-restricted uh, causal principle will apply to uh, states of God as well, right? And so the, the sort of Kalam cosmological argument that uh, Bill appeals to, right, it all depends upon restricting the causal principle in a way that's completely unjustified. And once you shift from that to an unrestricted version, then the uh, problem that was raised by the speaker comes up, uh, and there's no satisfactory answer to it. Question for Dr. Tooley. Yes. Um, Dr. Tooley, how do you personally account for uh, objective uh, value, morality, and purpose in the universe without God? Well, uh, the idea is this, that uh, on any view, ultimately, uh, you have to uh, have uh, right-making and wrong-making properties, right? And so, for example, you might maintain that uh, causing unnecessary suffering is morally wrong, right? And so what's the natural account of that? Well, the natural account of that is that uh, there is a notion of being a wrong-making property, and it's a property of the property 
of causing unnecessary suffering, right? And so that's the natural reading of it, right? Now what happens is that Mill rejects that natural reading, describes it as abstract and so on, says he doesn't understand it, right? You know, philosophers working in that area have no difficulty understanding the notion, right? And he substitutes something else for it. And what he substitutes is actually very unclear, right? It talks about, you know, uh, that, uh, the existence of an omniscient being who's loving and so forth and so on somehow is a truth-making making state of affairs for, you know, things being good or bad, right? But he gives no account in any of his articles or any of the debates, right, about how that works, okay, right? And as a matter of fact, there is no satisfactory account. There is an account you can give. You can try to uh, bring in, so to speak, a definition of moral properties in terms of God. But Bill himself is well aware that that sort of version of a theologically based ethics is open to a euthyphro style objection. So his goal is to evade that, right, and avoid it. But if you're going to avoid it, you have to give an account of how uh, states involving a omnipotent, omniscient person uh, can be a truth maker for uh, basic moral statements. And Bill has never offered any account of how that's possible. Well, I noticed that Dr. Tooley, rather than giving an account of his own explanation for objective moral values, tried to turn the tables and use it to criticize me. Uh, in fact, the view that I've defended, divine command morality, is defended by a number of eminent uh, philosophers today, including uh, people like Robert Adams in his uh, book, Finite and Infinite Goods, uh, Philip Quinn, uh, William Alston, Jean Marie Idziak, and, and many others. As for Dr. Tooley's view, you see, he says, well, wrong making property, that means it's a property which causes unnecessary suffering. But honestly, for the life of me, I can't see why on naturalism, it's wrong to cause unnecessary suffering. Animals do this all the time. And on atheism, that's all we are. It's just relatively advanced primates, uh, primates with somewhat more complex nervous systems. So I can't see any reason to think that that is a wrong-making uh, property. More of that theory is really completely inadequate as an ethical theory because it doesn't tell us what is good. It only would tell you what's wrong. Time. So I, I'm not persuaded he's answered the question. A question for Dr. Craig. We've heard arguments for the existence of God and uh, against the existence of God. Wouldn't it be reasonable to conclude that we just don't know enough to say whether he exists or not? Well, if you think that the arguments are evenly balanced, but I, I don't think they are. I, I certainly don't think in tonight's debate that it's evident that they're evenly balanced. I, I think it's been rather one-sided myself. So I, uh, I, I think that... My basic contention is true. Certainly there are arguments for atheism. I acknowledge that, and they have some force. But on balance, the arguments for theism are better. And so I think if you follow the evidence where it leads, you'll, you'll be a theist. One minute. Well, I mean, Bill has attempted to turn this debate into debate over naturalism versus supernaturalism, right? And that's why I don't know if you're thinking about that, right? Uh, but this is not a debate about supernaturalism versus naturalism. It's a debate about the existence of God, right? And I think that the argument from evil is an extremely natural argument. You go back to Job and so forth and so on, think about the problem of evil. I think it naturally strikes people that uh, suffering and so on experienced by the innocent, including young children, right, is a prime face the objection to the existence of God. And the question is whether you can develop that into a solid argument, right? And the only way to attempt to do so is by bringing inductive logic to bear upon the question. I've done this in detail in Knowledge of God. I look at the main approaches to inductive logic, state descriptions, structure descriptions, and so on. Bill simply responds by, in effect, embracing inductive skepticism, right? The basic principle I use, the equiprobability principle, right, is an extremely plausible principle, not rejected in any system of inductive logic that I know of, right? And it leads to both a sound account of the argument from evil and it provides an, argument, an answer to inductive skepticism. Time. Reject that principle and the situation is hopeless. Question for Dr. Tooley. Uh, yes, Dr. Tooley. Um, you stated that uh, unnecessarily causing suffering on sentient beings is a wrong-making property. Um, is, that, is that a starting principle or a self-evident truth, or is there something, is there a wrong-making property that makes that a wrong-making property? Do you see what I mean? 
Well, there are various ways one can go. Some people want to instead uh, take things back to uh, the satisfaction and frustration of desires, right? If you went that way, then you say that, you know, that the reason it's wrong to cause suffering is that their desires, e.g., to be, not to be experiencing that sensation, which are being frustrated, right? And so uh, moral philosophers would disagree on that, okay? But I think uh, relatively few philosophers would think that uh, the act, an act which has the property of causing suffering on uh, sentient beings and so on is not an action that likes the wrong making property. Wrong making property is something that makes something wrong, other things being equal. It can be outweighed by other considerations, so the claim is not that it's always wrong uh, to cause suffering, right? But the claim is that if an action has that property, uh, then that's a fact that makes the action probably face you wrong and it will make it wrong in the absence of other considerations, right? And, you know, uh, if I think about my colleague Mike Humor, right? Uh, he defends uh, ethical intuitionism, and uh, his view is, again, that there's an a priori connection between things like causing uh, property, causing needless suffering on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, the property being morally wrong. And that seems to me to be a perfectly tenable theory, and Bill has no objections at all to that theory, right? No arguments that he's offered against it. One minute. Uh, I just don't see any reason on atheism to think that causing unnecessary pain and suffering has a moral character to it. it. It seems to me that this is just natural. I would say that, that the property that makes things wrong, the wrong making property, is being forbidden by God. Uh, God is the supreme good, what was called in the medieval times the summum bonum, the, the uh, paradigm of goodness, and therefore has the authority to issue moral commands to us which constitute our duties. So what makes something wrong is that it's forbidden by God who is the moral authority. And that seems to me far more plausible than these moral duties on atheism that are just sort of floating in the air without any sort of grounding. Question for Dr. Craig. Yes, Dr. Craig. I'm a Christian, so I'm not opposing your position on the existence of God, but rather a statement that you made this evening, which I've also heard made in previous debates, that an actual infinite is impossible, mm -hmm. or infinity is merely an idea. And could you speak to the question, does not that reduce God to a mere idea or an uh -huh. impossible? Good question. Uh, the, I think we need to distinguish between what one could call a quantitative infinite and a qualitative infinite. The infinity of God is not a quantitative infinite. It doesn't mean that God is made up of an infinite number of definite and discrete parts. When theologians talk about God's infinity, they mean it in a qualitative sense, that God is morally perfect, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and so forth. It's not a quantitative concept. In fact, I would say that there really is no attribute of God called infinity. The, the word infinity is just an umbrella term for expressing all of God's superlative properties. Omnipotence, omniscience, uh, moral perfection, eternity, and metaphysical necessity. Uh, if you took all of those away, there isn't any property left over called infinity. That just is an umbrella term for all of those omni attributes. Uh, and none of those need involve a mathematical quantitative concept of an infinite number of definite discrete parts. So I don't think my argument against the mathematical infinity being instantiated in reality has any bearing on God's qualitative infinity. One minute response. Well, I want to uh, address the claim that some sort of quantitative notion of infinity is incoherent. I mean, the arguments that the bill offers for this are really just very bad arguments. So you get, you know, infinity minus infinity. Well, if you have all the natural numbers, you take away, you know, the even numbers, you're left with infinity, right? If, on the other hand, you have all the natural numbers, and you take away all the numbers larger than four, right? Then you're left with four. Contradiction. I mean, this is just a crazy argument, right? I mean, it's based upon the idea that somehow uh, there's an incoherence, a contradiction in the notion of an actual infinity of things. But on the other hand, there's no contradiction in the existence of an infinity of natural numbers, right? And so mathematics is consistent, but somehow this, this just does not fit together at all, right? And he brings in talk about ideas and so on, but I mean, that doesn't help, right? If there's a contradiction in the existence of an actual number of things, right, there's going to be actually a contradiction in the mathematics as well. And no mathematician would accept that sort of view. Question for Dr. Tooley. Dr. Tooley, 
You've tried to prove that the existence of evil makes it highly unlikely for the existence of God. How do you account for all the good in the world? Well, the, the, I mean, the existence of good is irrelevant to the argument, right? Okay, I mean, if you're, if on the other hand, if on the other hand, you know, the question was, is there a perfectly evil being in the world? Then you could run precisely the same argument, right? You could argue that there is good, you know, in the world, that we don't see any so be bad making properties associated with it and so on. And uh, so there'd be a good argument against the existence of a perfectly evil being. But I mean, the logic of the argument is such that basically you look at something that's morally wrong, right? Like the Haitian earthquake, right? And you say, look, if those are all the properties it has, the ones that we see, right, then surely a morally perfect being could not allow that. Now, Bill would disagree. Bill will say, God created all life and so on, and so he can wipe it out at any time. But that's just a morally crazy view. I doubt very much you think that, right? Uh, so, suppose you don't agree with him about that. Suppose you think that, you know, God can't just annihilate people right, left, and center any time for any reason he pleases, right? He needs a justification for it, right? And so you look at the Haitian earthquake, right? And you see that it has this immense wrong-making property. Again, Bill denies this, I think, with great implausibility, right? He says, no, no, nothing wrong with that, okay, right? I think we believe that allowing suffering of that sort to happen to innocent individuals, allowing them to be killed and so on, those things are seriously wrong unless they're counterbalancing properties. Then the basic idea of my argument is you consider the possibilities. It could be there's some unknown right-making property that cancels that out and makes it morally permissible to allow it. But from a logical point of view, it's just as likely there's an unknown wrong-making property that puts things in the other direction. And when you perform the calculations, it turns out that the likelihood that the action is morally wrong, all things considered, is greater than one half. And so the goodness doesn't enter into the argument. I've already argued tonight that the atheist does face a problem of good, namely to give any account of why there would be objective good and evil in an atheistic world. But let me say something in reply to the, the Haitian example. Um, I've argued that God's primary purpose for human history is to bring the optimal number of people freely into relationship with himself. And we have no idea how the different evils and disasters in the world uh, contribute to this. And I recently received an email from a fellow uh, in Haiti, Seth Barnes, a, a missionary there. And this is what he, he wrote about this. He said, something is remarkable is happening over there. It's unprecedented in my experience as a missionary. Revival is too small a word for what we saw in Haiti. Often we weren't able to move our vehicles because of the parades of people praising Christ. Everywhere there were prayer meetings, groups as small as 20 or as large as 60,000. Three months ago, the pastors of Haiti prayed for revival. They prayed that God would shake their land. They prayed that he would tear down the strongholds. The spiritual atmosphere of the country is completely different now. Voodoo priests by the hundreds have given their lives to Christ. Time. And, and I maintain that God can permit this sort of natural suffering in order to bring people freely into his kingdom and give them eternal life forever. Question for Dr. Craig. Uh, Dr. Craig. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. I've been Did I keep him work for yeah. some time yeah. now, yeah. Probably yeah. two or three years. Uh, in your opening speech about the resurrection of Jesus, uh, you listed three facts. Yes. Uh, now, in former debates that I've listened, you, you list four. Yes. And the fourth one being the burial uh, of Joseph Arimathea. Yes. Now, why did you leave it out? And secondly, with the burial of Joseph Arimathea not being a fact, then how do we establish the empty tomb? I left it out for time reasons. Oh. When I <laughs> so, when I debate a, a, a Muslim theologian, I'll include a fifth fact namely the crucifixion, because Muslims deny that Jesus was crucified, and yet this is an undeniable historical fact recognized by all historians. So there's the crucifixion, there's the burial by Joseph of Arimathea in the tomb, and then the three facts that I mentioned tonight. Um, and in the interest of time, I, I mentioned the three and uh, argued that the most plausible explanation is the resurrection. But as you know from my written work, uh, I'm prepared to defend the historicity of all five of those facts and do so in my published work. This, I just want to emphasize, this is the majority view among New Testament historians today that these facts are established. This isn't the view of just conservative or evangelical scholars. It's, it's remarkable, but this does represent the mainstream conclusions of New Testament scholarship today. 
And I, I think that the best explanation of these facts is that the God of Israel raised Jesus from the dead, that Jesus was who he claimed to be, and God vindicated those claims in a dramatic and public way. Yes, let me just comment on sort of the resurrection of Jesus argument. Uh, the first thing one has to do is one has to look at the probability of there being miracles in the world. Now, this isn't to be done in a priori fashion, as many philosophers have been guilty. You need to look at it empirically, right? And you need to look at the modern world and see whether or not there are good reasons for thinking that miracles occur in the modern world, right? And there are a number of books on this by Lewis Rose, Faith Healing, Faith Healing and so on, a book by Randy, and Investigating uh, Claims of Faith Healing. Uh, there was a report done by the Church of England uh, back around 1920. There was also a report done by the British Medical Association and so on, right? Uh, every study that's, every careful study that's been done, including Miracles at Lourdes, there's a book by D.J. West, 11 Lourdes Miracles, right? Has turned up a blank, okay? There are no good candidates for miracles in the modern world, right? And so the question is, what's going on historically? Uh, well, again, you have to look at things like the growth of healing legends. This book uh, by A.D. White, which details what happened in the case of uh, St. Francis Xavier. Uh, stories that had no miraculous element gradually get transformed into miracles, right? So that's the starting point for an examination of the probability that Jesus was resurrected, looking at the when not miracles occur in the modern world. Question for Dr. Tu. Dr. Tooley, your arguments only appear to challenge the morality of God. Would you attempt to disprove the existence of an all-knowing and all-powerful creator figure, and why? Well, I think, the, I think the situation is much less clear once you throw out the morality of God, right, then the argument from evil is irrelevant. Now, Bill, of course, did not suggest that the argument from evil was irrelevant, right? It was only when I pointed out that his arguments were not arguments for a perfectly good God that he shifts to this minimal conception of God, right? And so the arguments would be very different, right? Uh, if, you, if this were a debate on naturalism versus supernaturalism, which it's not, right? But a number of theistic philosophers, including Bill, uh, including Alvin Plantinga, cleverly attempt to turn the debate into a debate between naturalism and supernaturalism. This was Plantinga's strategy in the book that he wrote with me. His strategy was to attack naturalism. I point out that that, does, that gets you to supernaturalism, but doesn't get you to the god of monotheism. Now, Plantinga, at least, was honest, it seemed to me, right? He agreed that goodness had to be part of the definition of God. Bill wants to strip that out, okay, in order to avoid the force of the argument from evil and also to uh, avoid the criticisms of the arguments that he offered. Suppose that you did raise the question of, is there an omnipotent, omniscient spiritual being? Then it's a very different ballgame, right? And you need arguments for naturalism, right? And they, would be, they involve such things as the question of whether or not it's reasonable to believe that you and I have immaterial minds, okay? or whether there are reasons to believe that the only things in the physical world that we know of are purely physical material things, right? That would be the focus of the argument. Now, I think there are good arguments of that sort, and it's a view that's widely accepted by contemporary philosophers. Uh, the people like David Armstrong and Jack Smart have defended it at length, okay? But it's a very different argument, and it's not the topic of this debate, much as Bill would like to make it the topic of this debate. Okay, but would you support that position, or would you not? Yeah. I think what is accurate is to say that the problem of evil cannot refute the Kalam cosmological argument or the teleological argument. These give you a creator and designer of the universe, and uh, they don't pretend to give you the moral properties of this creator and designer. For that, you supplement it with the moral argument, which does give you God as a summum bonum or the supreme good. So what this really means is that if the atheist is to deny that there is a creator and designer of the universe, he's got to do more than just put forth the problem of evil. He's got to refute the premises of the cosmological and teleological argument. Otherwise, he's stuck with a transcendent, timeless, spaceless, unfathomably powerful personal creator and designer of the world, uh, which I think is a very uh, significant conclusion to be drawn. In the interest of uh, time, because we won't have enough time for you to interact with the debaters for a few minutes before we all have to vacate the building and maybe buy some material, we want to take one more question for each of the debaters. So we have one more for Dr. Craig. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, this is coming from a skeptic, I'm mean, not a skeptical, uh, a struggling Christian point of view versus a skeptical one, but um, if cause and effect for the most part, God is all powerful, almighty, and all knowing, correct? Yes. That was my idea of it, and that's the way I, I'm familiar with God. Yes. But uh, 
my question is, for the most part, if God is all-powerful, all, all-knowing and everything, for the most part, when he created Advent and Eve, he was kind of shocked that Eve did that. But if he created them, didn't he know they were going to do that? In respect, does that mean, for the most part, if I'm just doomed to go to hell, doesn't mean I'm just going to go to hell, cause, since he already knows technically uh-huh. when it's going to happen? I think God certainly does know what will happen. Yes, he has foreknowledge of the future. But you're expressing a position called theological fatalism, which says that if you know what will happen, then that thing cannot fail to not happen, or to to happen. And I think that that is a fallacious argument. I've written a great deal on this. You could look on my website, reasonablefaith.org, or one of my books like The Only Wise God. It moves from saying, necessarily, if God foreknows X will happen, X will happen, to from and the premise God knows X will happen to saying therefore necessarily X will happen and that commits a fallacy of modal logic all that happens all that follows from God's knowing that X will happen is that X will happen but it doesn't follow that it will happen necessarily it could fail to happen but if it were to fail to happen then God would have known something different so God's knowledge is chronologically prior to the event, but the event is logically prior to God's foreknowledge. The the event doesn't occur because God foreknows it. God foreknows it because it will occur. Do you see? God's knowledge is like an infallible barometer. An infallible barometer doesn't determine the weather. It's that the weather determines the barometer. And from the reading of the barometer, you know exactly what the weather will be. It's infallible. But that doesn't mean the weather has to be that way. You see, the, the, the barometer merely foreshadows what will happen. And if what would happen would be different, then the barometer would read differently. So there's no kind of fatalism that results from divine foreknowledge. You still have the freedom to do A or not A. And whatever you do will determine what God foreknew. Uh, two points. One is that the, the idea of divine foreknowledge is deeply problematic. What it presupposes is that later events can cause earlier events. Now, the philosophical jury is not in on whether or not that's logically possible. But there are a number of people who have attempted to show that uh, backwards causation running from later events to earlier events is logically impossible and gives rise to a contradiction. And you can show that attempts by people like David Lewis and so on to get around that are unsatisfactory, right? So dying foreknowledge is very problematic. But secondly, to come to the notion of hell, at various points, Bill has said, defended hell, okay? But I mean, think about a being who's perfectly good, right? Now, the question is, why would you think that being would set up the world in such a way that if you don't believe certain things or if you do certain things, you wind up in a place that's a very unpleasant place that you'll never be able to get out of? It seems to me that a truly good God would leave the door open for prodigal sons and daughters to return at any point. If the door is locked on hell, that's something God has done, right? If there's no escape from it, right? And that seems to me to be a a radically unsatisfactory conception of a being that one wants them to go on to describe as perfectly good. So I think that idea should be rejected. Yes, you seem to use inductive reasoning a great deal in your argument. And uh, the definition that I have heard is uh, using specific examples to draw general conclusions, correct? So I was wondering if, um, by the definition itself, if inductive reasoning is capable of yielding absolute certainty of anything. Okay, well, first of all, let me say that the the conception of inductive reasoning that you've been exposed to is an unsatisfactory conception. It's a conception you find in the philosopher David Hume, where you look at various instances. Here's a raven, it's black. Here's another raven, it's black. Probably the next raven is black, or probably all ravens are black, okay? You can show that if that's all there is to inductive reasoning, then uh, there are very skeptical challenges that you can't answer in any way. For example, one thing is that you can't get from knowledge of the macroscopic world, tables and chairs, to knowledge of electrons, protons, and neutrons. You'll never get an instance we'll get started, okay? So philosophers realized, beginning with C.S. Peirce in uh, the 1890s, that you needed a broader conception. And uh, it's sometimes referred to as inference, the best explanation, right? So the idea is that you look at hypotheses, you see what the predictions are, you check out why not they're true, you look at what it can explain causally and so on. And the greater its explanatory power, the more reason there is to think that hypothesis is true, right? Uh, you need to consider competing hypotheses and then see uh, whether they have equal explanatory power 
and uh, whether they're as simple and so forth and so on. So you need a much broader conception of induction than you have, right? Now, induction does not lead to certainty, right? But the idea is, you know, if you've looked at a thousand things with a certain property and you found they have another property, right, then the idea is the probability that the next one has that property is greater than it would have been before you examined the 1,000 things, right? So the idea is that induction can gradually raise the probability of something, right? And I say the sort of principle I appeal to of equiprobability can show how that's done, okay? And that's not a trivial task because on many conceptions, there's no way of showing that induction is a sound method. So it's sound is consistent in raising the probability of hypotheses, right? It doesn't consist in uh, showing you that something's absolutely certain. Uh, it can't do that. Yeah. I want to reiterate that Dr. Tooley's inductive argument from evil is based upon principles of inductive reasoning that he derives from Rudolf Carnap in the mid-20th century, which according to the probability theorists I've talked to, are highly controverted and yield arbitrary and therefore non-objective probabilities. They're designed for a highly artificial language. They don't apply to real life situations. And that therefore virtually no philosopher regards these as yielding the correct estimation of objective probabilities. Instead, we need an alternative approach to justify uh, inductive reasoning, such as I offered tonight from Peter Wally's article uh, in the uh, Journal of the Royal Statistical Society uh, entitled Inferences from Multinomial Data, Learning About a Bag of Marbles, where this professor of mathematics justifies a robust Bayesian approach that doesn't depend upon these controverted principles that Dr. Tooley relies on and that are at the very heart of his inductive argument for evil. If those principles go, the whole argument goes down the drain. And uh, for that reason alone, I think that his argument against God tonight is uh, a failure. There's enough time left in the evening, perhaps, if you can hang around for some interaction with the debaters, if they are so willing to maybe get an autograph of their books. Be aware that there are books for sale in the back. You might want to avail yourself to those and purchase. If you have your information card filled out, if you would be so kind to drop that in the box. And if you are so inclined as well to contribute financially to the efforts of Ratio Christi, you can make your donation there in that same box. Thank you for your attendance tonight.